Well, welcome to Shoreline Conversations. We are we're in a series on organic disciples. I'm really excited to be back for week number two uh, as we're going to talk about Bible engagement today with uh, Pastor Kevin Harney. So I'm excited to uh, invite you into this conversation as we look at the Bible and its role in our lives. Well, Kevin, it's glad I'm glad to be back with you as yeah. we continue on this series through Organic Disciples. And today we get to talk about the Bible and Bible engagement. Yeah. Uh, pretty kind of a big deal, you know, that we can, I think it's a good way to uh, launch into yeah. these uh, seven markers that we're going to go through yeah. from here forward. So let's just start in the Bible. Yeah. When did you get your first Bible and what did you think of it when you, when you yeah. had it? Yeah, I didn't uh, grow up with a Bible in my home. Uh, now my dad had read the Bible and lots of other texts of, he would call them religious texts and study them, but they were on a section in his library in his, in my parents in their bedroom. In my study, I have a large library. In my parents' bedroom, an entire wall, floor to ceiling, and a long, good sized room um, was just books, floor to ceiling, and my parents were both very avid readers. Uh, so there, I think there was a Bible around the house, but I wasn't given a Bible until I became a Christian. I was given a Bible, I put these up here, much like this one, uh, the Revised Standard Study Bible, study notes by Harold Linzel, and uh, and I my, I keep my Bibles for about three to five years, and then I retire them and I get a new Bible. And so that Bible I lost after, mm-hmm. I don't know, a couple of years, put on top of my sweet yeah. lime yellow opal Terrible Manta, story, yeah. drove <laughs> off, boom, gone. I went back to find it, found my notebook, didn't find the Bible. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I got another identical Bible and identical Bible cover, because this is the the cross uh, that I was given <laughs> when I got my Bible. It was a gift from a, a youth leader, and I and I just dug in again. And so this this is uh, this one after about four or five years was pretty much um, uh, devastated with. I, I just I love the Bible. I love reading the Bible. And so then uh, this is Bible number three. This is Bible number four. And then my other eight or nine Bibles are in my study. You, so you here. do keep them all. I keep them all. Yeah, I keep them in order. Uh, and the one I, the Bible I'm using right now uh, I've had for about two years or so, and it's got another year, year and a half in it before it gets. And I, I also like to read different translations. When I'm preaching, I always use the same translation we use at the church. Mm-hmm. But for my personal reading, I went I went back about 10 years ago to the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version. And it was funny because I memorized lots of Bible passages in the Revised Standard Version. Then when I read it from another version, my brain almost triggers right. back to the old version. But but so, and my first Bible was a gift from uh, from this youth leader who said, you're a Christian, so you're supposed to read the Bible. And it's God's word. It's true from beginning to end. So here's your Bible. Read it, and and I've been doing it ever since. So apparently, so, I, I I paid attention. So as you read it, though, did, did were you able to receive it as this is God's word and this is going to change my life here, or was it I got to read through it, so I'm better just read through it? Yeah, good question. Some of both. Okay. Um, I'm uh, I'm a fairly yeah, fo- you could you say focused or compulsive person. You know, it depends on if you want to be flattering or not. <laughs> but uh, but I'm kind of I when I get into something, I get into it. Uh, when I love something, I love it a lot. Mm-hmm. And so I dug in. But I I, I believed that I, I I believed enough to say if this is God's word, if God breathed this, if God revealed this, if God gave this word, however God did it. I was only 15 at the time, so I had wasn't real complex in my thought process. But I thought if this is God's word, if these, I made this commitment to Jesus as best I could, then I want to know what it says from beginning to end. And so uh, there were parts of it that absolutely turned my heart upside down in a beautiful way that spoke to me, that I felt like I felt like God was, was revealing his truth to me personally in a very personal way, which I think is what the Bible does. Right. Um, but there were also times where I, want, where I literally want to throw it against the wall and never read it again because I thought, what in the world is this? There was stuff that was so crazy or seemed I couldn't make any sense of Um, some of the wars in the Old Testament some of the things that that people now would say the difficult sayings of the Bible or in the New Testament the hard sayings of Jesus and I'd get across go across those things I'd be like I didn't have parents that were encouraging me to read the Bible Mm -hmm. I didn't have any framework and even the guy who gave me the Bible didn't really mentor me in Bible reading he just said read it and so uh, I dug in and I actually I literally and I've shared this with you know as I preach I'll share this that I my mom thought I was that summer. I thought I was going crazy because I told her, uh, "Don't if the phone rings." Back then, there were not. I didn't have a phone in my room. Um, if the phone rings, don't. I, I'm not going to do anything until noon. I get up in the morning until noon. I just study the Bible. 
and I'd read big portions of the Bible. And if I couldn't figure it out, I would create charts and graphs. So my wall had my, I remember a, I had that um, graph paper with little squares going both ways and you know, all the little squares. And I had, I created a diagram for first, second Samuel, first, second Kings, first, second Chronicles, that portion of the Bible with all the Kings of Israel, with all the Kings of Judah, with all the Kings of the foreign nations, the, the Assyrian Kings and, the, and, and then the prophets and where they fit in. And I had color coded and diagrammed it. And I, it was probably about eight or nine feet long, about three, three columns of, of rows of these sheets. And I remember my mom came in one day and she said, what is this? I said, well, mom, I said, I'm trying to understand the Bible because it's God's word, but I can't figure out who's who and what's going on. And I, it took me a while to figure out that there, when I got the idea that there was this one nation of God and then that they, they became two different kingdoms. And I was like, okay, well, who is this king from this one or that one? And so I would just, I color coded all the kings of, of the Northern kingdom, Israel here, all the kings of Judah, the Southern kingdom here. I, and that was it. I just wanted to understand it. And so I just, I just kept digging in and pressing through. Yeah. I'm just, yeah. Ref I'm laughing because uh, our approach is just so completely different, or was back then. <laughs> I'm even thinking of your Bibles. Like, I still have my first Bible. Yeah. And for the first 30 some years of my life, it almost still looked new. Oh. Um, like, it was pristine, and yeah. I turned the pages carefully. You don't, you, never, you, you don't like to write in your Bible. I can't Bible. Yeah. write in my yeah. Bible. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, it got wet yeah. in a leaky garage. Yeah. And so now it looks like that, yeah. but not because of my use. <laughs> and uh, just a completely different approach um, yeah. in, in the way you do it. That's great. Well, I told, I told Thomas, um, he, we, were, we were talking about this before we started recording, and I said the book of Philippians is a, was a book of the Bible that I really loved, and so wow, he turned he, 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 literally he, missing. He, he turned right to it because it's all it's all falling apart. But I literally had to and you fill I, it I, in. Had to paint in I mean tape in paper and finish the passage because it just started falling apart. But um, that's that's my I interact with things and I'm so two weeks yeah. ago I was in Philippians yes and I turned my page a little too aggressively. And I now have a half inch rip in it. Did you repent, and I think, and pray, and confess Jesus? I, think, <laughs> I was thinking I need to buy a new Bible because oh, no. I don't know what I can do with that one page. I ruined right. it. I'm I'm a yeah. mess that way. Yeah, yeah. So you've obviously started off really intensely studying yeah. the Bible. Intensely. I mean, that's an incredible yeah. picture. Um, today, I mean, yeah. have you continued with that gusto yeah. for forty yeah. for four decades, forty plus years working yeah. on that? What does it look like now, the Bible in your life? Yeah, so I uh, really, I, I want to say every morning, but th that's that's not honest. Um, the vast, vast, vast majority of mornings when I wake up, um, I make the bed and pray for my wife because that's a commitment I made years ago. I go into the, my study, sit in my chair, and just to my left here on a shelf is my current devotion. I have my preaching Bible, which is different than my devotional Bible. Pull my devotional Bible and my journal out. This morning I spent time in, uh, in Exodus 5 and 6, and read through that and reflected on it and wrote down about four or five insights that struck me. And then took one of those insights and framed a prayer direction, prayed for you, uh, prayed for your wife, Shannon, prayed for your kids um, over, out, out of, out of hmm. this, particular, uh, this particular text. And, um, and lots, not just you and Shannon. No, I know that. But, but a, a group of people. <laughs> you go down your list. And yeah. so I pray, I, I read through and pray through the scriptures um, almost every day. And it's, it's more alive and more powerful. Um, it just continues to grow in its impact on my life. And, um, and I have fewer times where I feel like throwing it against the wall and saying, right. what's the craziness here? Not because I figured it all out, but because I have a sense of God's sovereignty and God's wisdom. And I've, somewhere along the line, I've, it's, it's, I've come to a place where I've actually recognized that God's probably smarter than me yeah. by a, a long shot. And so there's things I can't comprehend. Mm -hmm. But I, but I um, honor God's sovereign rule of the universe. And so if I can't put the pieces together, I go as far as my brain will let me go. And then I just say, I'll hold on to that until I see Jesus one day. Or maybe I'll, there'll be something, an insight that'll go, okay, I have a better understanding of that. But, there, but there's still challenging parts in the Bible. But, but the conviction of the Bible on my heart and my life is always there. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and every time I read the scriptures, there's three, four, five different things that will jump out at me that could change, that could impact my life. I try to only focus on one because otherwise I just get overwhelmed and fall in a heap on the ground and go, I can't do that. You right. know, but, but I'll try to take one thought 
and say, let me carry this through my day and let it guide my prayer and try to shape who I am. So would you say that you have seen that consistently since you started reading it at 15 mm-hmm. throughout, yeah. that yeah. you've always yeah. been able to yeah. to get something out of there? Yeah, 25, 35, 45, 55. So for 44 like years, yeah. thereabouts, uh, yeah. And I... Uh, yeah, it's become a rhythm of my life. And another thing that I think is important is that I don't read my Bible when I get up in the morning in that time for my congregation. Mm-hmm. I don't read it for sermons. I don't read it for um, a devotional I'm going to teach. I just sit and say, Jesus, let your word speak to my heart and make me who you want me to be. And uh, and God honors that prayer. Yeah. That's neat. Yeah. Well, we're talking about becoming more like Jesus. Mm-hmm. That's what it means to be a disciple mm-hmm. of of uh, God. Um, so when we're one of Jesus' disciples, we want to become more like him. Mm-hmm. Uh, what role did the Bible play in his life? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting because, you know, Jesus is called, he's called the Word of God. You know, he's the living Word of God. Um, he, he spoke the truth of Scripture. So he, he, the words he spoke have become, have been recorded as the written Word of God. Um, but for Jesus, the scriptures were the Old Testament, right? Um, and it wasn't those, those scriptures weren't put together in the same fashion we have them right now. But Jesus, it's it's astounding if you study the life of Jesus. If you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you look for those times where it says, you know, where Jesus says something like, you know, you have heard that it was said. That's almost always he's he's talking about a Bible passage from the Old Testament. If he says it is, it was written. He's talking to the Old Testament. And a lot of times he just is just talking and he weaves in pictures and images from the Old Testament. If you don't know the Old Testament, you're not going to recognize it. Right. But it's amazing how often the scriptures were on the heart of Jesus, on the lips of Jesus. And his his love for the scriptures, you know, and, and he, he actually was clear that he didn't come to do away with the law and the prophets, right. but to fulfill them. And mm-hmm. so Jesus' life was about fulfilling uh, what the Old Testament had prophesied, but also where the Old Testament painted a picture of what our lives could be like in following God, Jesus came as God among us and gave us a way to live uh, following after him. And mm-hmm. so Jesus loved the scriptures. Uh, Jesus quoted the scriptures. And Jesus' deepest moments of pain, toughest moments of temptation, greatest moments of joy, what flowed out of Jesus was scripture. Mm-hmm. And so as, a, as his disciple, for me personally, I want the word of God to be so much a part of me that when I'm in temptation, when I'm in a difficult time, when I'm in a joyful time, what comes out of me is just naturally scripture flows out of me. And I'm not close to where I want to be in that because sometimes if I'm frustrated, the first thing that comes out of me isn't scripture. Uh, Far sometimes, from it, maybe? So, yeah, some, sometimes <laughs> when I'm, you know, when I'm tempted, it's, it's, you know, and, and, but, but there's that vision and that model. And I've been a Christian a long time mm-hmm. and I feel like I'm learning and growing in that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm always longing to be more like Jesus. And so, uh, his word is, you know, opening the word and reading it, opening the scriptures and reading it uh, to me on a daily basis helps to define who I am and how to live my life. Neat. Yeah. So the Bible itself, um, what does the Bible say about the Bible? Like what can we read in the Bible yeah. about what it is yeah. and what it yeah. should mean to us? Yeah. Well, the Bible uses all kinds of images of itself. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you can go to like the beginning of Ezekiel where he has this vision and he's given the scroll, which is a picture of scripture. And, and he's told in this vision to eat it. Right. And he eats it and he says, and it's, he says it, it was as sweet as honey. He said, pictures, there's times you read the scripture and it's just like, oh, it's delightful. It encourages you. It builds you up. Um, the, the Bible refers to itself as sh- sharper than a two-edged sword. Uh, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joint and marrow, discerning the thoughts, the intentions of the heart, that the mm-hmm. scriptures come and they kind of open up our heart and show us you know, where the cancer of our sin could be, where our souls are really at, and then becomes, uh, you know, becomes that healing power we need. In, in, in Ephesians, the, the, uh, in this great passage in Ephesians chapter 6, which is dealing with spiritual warfare, we're told to you know, take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, I don't think that means just the, the Bible, you know, scriptures of the Bible, but it's the as God reveals his word. Well, the primary way he does it is in the scriptures. So it's, it's there for our spiritual battles against the enemy. And it, mm-hmm. so there's image after image after image of, of what the, you know, your, your word, O Lord, is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path in Psalm 119. So, okay, you're, it illuminates where I'm going, my next step. Where, how do I take the next step in this relationship, in my life, in this complex situation? Let your word be the lamp that kind of lights my way. And, and so there's just, so the, the Bible gives us all kinds of images of itself. And what I love is that's not monolithic. It's not like, okay, right. the Bible is just One this. Way. It's a textbook. Now, 
There's one passage that talks about all scriptures inspired by God that's profitable for teaching, reproving, correcting, training, and righteousness. So that it has sort of that teach, reprove, correct, so that, that didactic teaching, almost textbook sort of feel to it in that right. passage. But there's all these other images. And what I love is that when you pick up the Bible, when I, when I, as, a, as a, so I would have been 15, 16, about 19 years old when this was my primary Bible. <laughs> um, when I would pick this up and read it, one of the joys of that was I had no idea what was going to happen. I just knew I was going to read. And, and there's, there'd be times where the, the Bible was just fortifying me spiritually. And I couldn't, it's sort of like eating a, a healthy meal. Um, you don't eat a healthy meal and go, I just feel so much healthier all of a sudden. I feel stronger. It takes, it go, happens over time. But, but feeding on this book day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, decade after decade, it builds spiritual strength. And so, um, yeah, so I just, I just, there, there's there's a, a power in the word and there's a joy in reading the word and so um you know my my commitment and my as a pastor i'm constantly i probably drive the shoreline congregation crazy. i've only been senior pastor in two churches here at shoreline and at, at corinth uh, church in, in byron center michigan but in both cases uh i'm not quite as many years here as i was there mm -hmm. getting close uh, but after you've been a pastor for a certain amount of people time <clears throat> people start to say well you know boy he says that a lot uh, but one of the things I do is I challenge people to open the word. I mean, if if this is God's spirit breathed truth, um, why not mm -hmm. open it every day? And and then the and the the stuff that we do watch or read or listen to, um, if you compare it to what the Bible brings to you, how you know it's it's and it's easy to sit down and and binge watch. You know, I'm gonna just watch for a half an hour, and six hours later, you know, you, you've you've finished the series or whatever, and you're deciding, do I watch another series tonight or early into tomorrow morning? You know, it's like, well, that's e it's easy. I mean, we can get drawn into that, but when we're feasting on all these other things that are neutral, maybe slightly edifying, neutral, or just you know, intellectual junk food and mm -hmm. spiritual junk food, why not make sure that we're feasting on God's word as a regular commitment? So now you do say a lot. Um, read the Bible read yeah. the Bible, get in the word. It's going to change your life. Um, I'm hopeful. I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that people will uh, listen to this podcast though, because yeah. I think they're going to get a different feel for it. Yeah. Like just the passion with which you're yeah. able to talk about the Bible and what yeah. it's done for you. Yeah. Uh, it's exciting me, yeah. truthfully, being yeah. right here across yeah. this table. Yeah. It's exciting me about what mm -hmm. it can, uh, I want to be able to describe the Bible the way mm -hmm. you do. Yeah. And so I'm yeah. hopeful that yeah. other people yeah. will be that same way. You know, Keith, one thing that's is kind of crazy is when I started reading the Bible, because I didn't grow up in the church, you know, people would say to me, well, but like, you know, you know the story of David and Goliath. Oh, you, well, you, but you know the story, you know, like Jesus and the resurrection. I'm like, I don't know anything. <laughs> I, I didn't grow up with this. I was not taught any of this. Um, and I, you know, I didn't have that as part of my family legacy. Right. And so I, I started with, with, uh, with, with the philosophers would call the, the tabula rasa, the blank, blank, tab, blank slate, right. blank. My, my mind was blank when it came to the Bible, but I opened it and began to read it. What was amazing to me was how many things in the Bible very quickly, very readily became clear what it was saying and gave deep joy or deep conviction for me. Now there's a bunch of stuff I'd read that didn't make any sense at all. I, it took me years to figure out what's going on here or there and how this all fits together. But there was enough things that I read in the Bible that were revolutionary for me that I, that it, that I wanted to know it more and have it shape who I, who I am. And that's that's the journey I'm still on as I I hope as passionately as it's ever been. I, I hope more passionately. It sounds like it. Well, just so you know, I wasn't yeah. around back then, but it sounds like yeah. you're passionate about it. Yeah. I want to go back to Jesus and you talked about you know, we I asked you what uh, what role the Bible played in yeah. in his life, and you said the Old Testament was his Bible, mm -hmm. uh, and then you you did mention a couple of uh, things that he had quoted from there. Yeah. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more on yeah. on Jesus' use of the Old Testament, yeah. and and because yeah. I think he used it um, both in positive way, yeah. well, it was yeah. always positive, yeah. but uh, in uplifting and encouraging, mm -hmm. and yeah. also in challenging yeah. and correcting. Yeah. Um, what are some of the the times that you could uh, see Jesus using yeah. the Bible. Well, one of the things Jesus did a lot of is he would correct people's understanding of the Bible. Uh, and so the religious leaders of his day knew the Old Testament, you know, as what they, they, well. they, if you talked about the, the prophecy of Isaiah, if you talked about the Pentateuch, you know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, they not only knew it, in many cases, they'd committed the entire, entire portion of the Bible to, to memory, um, rigorous study, rigorous training. And then Jesus would say, 
okay, you got it, kind of. You know, to use an image I used in my sermons last Sunday, you think you nailed it. You think, oh, right. I nailed it, I got it. And it's like, but, but wait a minute, you don't fully. So you say, why, well, you know, so Jesus will say, you know, you have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery or do not murder. And, and in their mind, they're saying, well, didn't sleep with anybody, didn't kill anybody, check, I'm good. And Jesus says, but, but you're missing the point. Mm -hmm. With adultery, what's happening in your heart? Where are your eyes wandering? Are you, it's, it's, Jesus was saying it's bigger than what you think. Murder, I didn't kill anybody. Yeah, but do you call, do you use the term raka? Which in, in, the, oh, in that ancient time meant empty headed one or fool. So if you look at someone and call them a fool, he says, you're in danger of the fires of hell. Mm -hmm. Well, that's pretty serious. Well, what's Jesus saying? You think you understand the scriptures because you understand the words on the scroll, but you don't understand what it means and how it's supposed to transform your life. So Jesus spent a lot of time clarifying, expanding, and he's saying, I'm not changing. And, and Jesus never uh, went against what scripture said, but he went against their commentary, their their teaching. And they had, ter they had terms for that. Um, Mishnah, Talmud, different things, but they, they had terms for their all the all the teaching. And, and the ancient, the first century Jews actually said that their job was to build a fence around the law. They said they would take they'd build all these rules and regulations around the 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 Old Testament scriptures against the law of God to protect to protect people uh, or to protect the law from people tampering with it. But what they they ended up doing was keeping people from actually knowing it, even themselves. So a lot of Jesus is teaching when you say you have heard that it was said this, but I say to you. He's not questioning the scriptures. He's questioning how they're interpreting the scriptures and where they've taken it. Mm. So the Old Testament talks about Sabbath. Right. And they had, so they put, a, they put a fence around the idea of Sabbath. And, and they just they said, we're going to keep you as far away from breaking the Sabbath as possible. So they had all these ridiculous rules, regulations, and laws that then got interpreted into like in modern days where you would have like an, an Orthodox Jewish person who on... Friday before sundown, we put tape across the lights in their refrigerator so that when they open the door, the light doesn't come on because that light coming on is an act of work and you can't do work. And you go, okay, that's not, Jesus, that's not what I'm talking about. Well, first of all, there weren't lights in refrigerators back then, but <laughs> but, but, you, but you, what Jesus was saying to them is you're, you're creating all these nitpicky, silly little regulations, but the spirit of this, Jesus said, but you know, Sabbath, you know, we weren't we weren't made to be subservient to the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made to bring us rest and peace, mm -hmm. and so not rest and peace like you died, but yeah, rest right. and peace. And so, so Jesus is basically saying you missed the point. Mm -hmm. And so he does a lot of in interpreting and explaining and taking away their man-made wall around the word and getting it back to the heart of what it really said and meant. And so Jesus did lots of clarifying right. because people were misusing the word. Do you think we're in danger of that happening with us today? I think every time any human being opens the Bible and reads it, uh, we are prone to want to get the Bible to say what we think. Mm -hmm. We are prone to to simplify from the beauty of enjoy the the, the rest and the, the 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 gift of a Sabbath to turning it into rule, rules and regulations and look, I do it better than you. That's the condition of the human heart. That's what Jesus came to save us from our sins, but. And if you know Jesus, your sins are washed away, but we're still battling with those same sorts of things. So I think it's it continues to be a challenge, and and that's why we need to to read that you know we need to let Scripture interpret Scripture, and let the Spirit of God speak to our hearts, but really scrutinize our own view of things because our I think everything in the human heart is to take any source of authority and make it agree with us. Mm -hmm. And with the Bible, we are supposed to be subservient to what it teaches. So if you bump, a, bump into something in the Bible that really challenges you, and that's not what you really want to hear. So as a, as a young believer, so the woman I'm married to, uh, Sherry, when we were dating, when we were engaged, um, the Bible was clear about moral boundaries, about sexual boundaries, mm -hmm. about how we lived in our relationship with each other. And, uh, and I found myself trying to do gymnastics with that, trying to find some way around those things because I was a... I was a um, warm-blooded uh, young American California surf boy who uh, thought she was beautiful and uh, and you know so I, I was saying well how can I push the boundaries and and I'm looking at God's word and it gives me clear direction I'm looking at what I want and I'm saying can I make the Bible 
accommodate what I want. And, and one of the things I've watched as a pastor, my whole ministry, it's one of the biggest challenges I have as a pastor is talking to people who are clearly, they love Jesus, they believe the Bible, but if the Bible disagrees with them, mm-hmm. they want to, they want to toss out the parts or even, well, but for me, that doesn't really, that doesn't really apply. And, and change the Bible to fit their lifestyle versus change their lifestyle to fit the Bible. And that's, I think that will be forever a battle. And uh, that's part of our spiritual journey is, is trying to say, I'm not going to manipulate the word to, to, to fit my life. I'm going to submit my life to fit what God calls me to do because, because God is wiser than I am. And if we really believe that, then we don't even at times have to understand exactly why. I never, when, when Sharon and I were dating, I never said, I, I necessarily agree with the word on boundaries, but I said, I want to live within those boundaries because I trust God is wiser than I am. While yeah. you were talking, I was being drawn back to when I was a young child. Uh, and we used to have these little Bible books and a tape, a cassette tape. It was this little rectangular thing that you would put in this little music player. Cassette tape yeah. player, yeah. And periodically it would the tape would all fall out of it. But yeah. I had like, um, I'd have stories. So yeah. I knew David and Goliath yeah. from when I was three years old. Yeah. Um, but it didn't mean a lot to me, right? It was this fun story about this little guy who beat this big person, yeah, you know? Yeah. Uh, and then I'm thinking now to today, um, I can actually get something from that Bible and the knowledge yeah. it, that I find in the Bible yeah. can really transform my life as you're, as you're yeah. saying. So what steps can we take to not just learn the stories really, yeah. but, but yeah. to gain a, an overall knowledge of the, of the Bible and yeah. then how it applies to our lives? Yeah. Well, one, I think one very practical step that, um, and I'm thankful that the first Bible someone gave me was actually a study Bible. And so this, you know, this revised standard study Bible, um, the guy who gave it to me said, okay, I'm giving you this Bible. And the print's pretty small to start with, but he said, he said, okay. And so I'll I'll look over here, um, you know, so here, he said, this is the Bible. Then there's a line here and the little print down here, that is not the Bible. That's commentary that's um that's i'm I'm losing my bible um he said that that's that the smaller print that's a team of scholars who will give you background history what's going on and so the first time i read through the bible i read the bible but i also read all the notes at the bottom and that was and and often i said be reading like, what in the world does that word mean i looked down oh it means this and and i was almost it was almost like it read my mind because Mm -hmm. the things they put down there were the most the most needed things right and so and so I would say to people, um, if you've never used a study Bible, it's a great tool. Uh, at the beginning of each book of the Bible and the study Bible, it'll give you the history, the background, the outline of the book, uh, the, the, the historical context, what's going on. So you kind of go, oh, I see where this fits within. And so again, the first Bible that was given to me, some people would say, well, you probably should have just given a Bible without all those other notes. But for me, because I actually read the whole thing and took it very seriously, um, that filled in a lot of gaps for me and help make sense of a lot of things. And so I would say, you know, people that want to take a step forward, uh, you know, utilize the study Bible, I would say, um, and this is pretty radical, but I would say, read it regularly. You know, I'd say, you know, actually open it and read it. I would say, read it intelligently, uh, meaning understand the flow of the story. So just two weeks ago, I was talking with a young guy who, who comes to church here and he was telling me he's been reading his Bible, but it's, it's hard to figure out because it doesn't seem like everything's in order. And I said, well, it's not. It's, it's grouped by genre. So you have the wisdom literature, you have Psalms and Proverbs, Ecclesiastes all together. Even though there's Psalms that are hundreds of years apart, they're all in the same book. You know, you have a Psalm that's written by Moses and one by David. They're in different, they live in different times. And then and you go, okay, then you go to the prophets. And you have you know, minor prophets that were at an entirely different time in history, but we read them as if they're all together. We read it like it's a chronology, it's not. So I gave this young guy a copy of the story, which is something we did here at Shoreline over about a year's time, which is the whole storyline of the Bible. And it chronologically organizes about 30% of the text of the Bible into almost like a novel. And I gave it to him and I said, now listen, this isn't the Bible. This is portions of the Bible. And every so often there's these little parts in italics that are sort of bridging together the portions of the Bible. But everything in here is chronological so you can read it and get the storyline of the Bible. He came back to me about two weeks later with three buddies of his. This was actually a week ago Sunday. And he said, uh, I, he says, it's making sense. My brother and this friend of mine and his brother, and these are all guys that's probably in their 20s, they, can they have one too? And I, and instead of saying go buy one, I, I had <laughs> copies, so I love giving stuff away. So I got him each one and had a prayer with them that they would dig into the word. And, um, 
And so I would say to people, get the storyline, however you do it, you know, um, you could do a chronological Bible reading program, read the whole Bible in a year chronologically. You can do it like with something like the story that is an easier read. You get about 30% of the Bible, then you can go back and fit things into, the, into their place, but get the storyline. Uh, but, and, and one other thing I'd share is just each time you read the Bible, ask the question, so what? What does this matter? What does this mean? How does it impact my life? And if you're just a little bit thoughtful, um, you can see truths come through. You can see things that will impact your life. You can see uh, ways to live in a new way. The book of James talks about don't just, you know, don't just be a hearer of the word of the Bible. Don't just listen to what it says, but do what it says. Let it transform your life. And so, and in the doing of that, I think we then understand the depth of scripture at a whole different level. I love the story. I yeah. uh, actually just bought the audio hmm. uh, last week. So that's going to be something yeah. I've been doing this year nice. as a supplement. You know, I'm still going to read the Bible and yeah. study the Bible. Yeah. Um, but to get that piece yeah. of it, I, I yeah. got the audio for it. Nice. Um, what does it mean to love the Bible? Hmm. Yeah. In, in Psalm 119, uh, David says, oh, how I love your law, O Lord. I mean, how I, I love your word. I love you. I, I love the law of God. I love, and in the, book, in the book of Psalms, in Psalm 119, the Bible is called... God's law, God's precepts, uh, uh, God's word, God, you know, all these different terms, which are talking about the scriptures. And so um, I think it means that you uh, honor it, you respect it. You know, what, what does it mean to love Shannon, your wife? Right? What does it mean to love Megan, your wife? It, it, means, it means that there's a respect, there's an honor, uh, there's a relationship. Um, you see, a relationship with the Bible? In a sense, yeah, there, there is, uh, it's one of my teachers. It's my strong. It's my greatest teacher, and the Holy Spirit speaking through the Word. If you know, I, I love to learn. I love to read, uh, and I have certain people I read uh, everything they write. I have other people I read different things they write, uh, but I only have one book that I know is breathed by God. And so um, I, I think you have there's a, sort of a relationship with the Scripture, and it, it's one of affection and appreciation. And and I think if if I said to people I love my wife but I spent no time with her, they say you don't really love her. Um, I've spent time with the word. I spent time with God as I read the word. So I think that I think that that is a picture of a friendship of a relationship that you're learning from the word that there's an honoring of God as you read it. And uh, that's a, a little snapshot, yeah. So I told you earlier how I I knew Bible stories from an early mm -hmm. age, um, but I didn't really I don't think it changed my life. I could mm -hmm. tell you about David Goliath and mm -hmm. Jonah and the big fish or the whale. I mean, I could tell you these things. I could tell you about the Red Sea being parted and all of these yeah. stories. I had the knowledge. Uh, it sounds like, and I already know this, right? So I'm, it's a leading question. Yeah. It sounds like there's more to it than just knowledge. Yeah. That there should be mm -hmm. more to our our use of the Bible mm -hmm. than just getting some facts yeah. and some storylines. Yeah. Um, why is not... Just knowing the Bible, not mm -hmm. enough, in your opinion. Yeah, I, th I think if we go after Bible knowledge alone, it's a real recipe for arrogance. We can start to play the, I know more than you do. It becomes a competitive thing or a show-off kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> when, it starts, when it changes our hearts and our lives, there is... Um, there's a whole different view of the Bible. It's not like it's not like this weapon I wield uh, against other people. It's something that God uses to transform me. And so I know that every time I open the scripture, something's happening. If I'm reading God's word, if I'm listening to it, if I'm paying attention, if I'm actually actually not just uh, I, I if it becomes a checklist, I did it, I'm done with it. Then maybe nothing's going to happen inside of me. But if I if I say God, teach me, speak to me. I encourage people before when they open up the Bible, each time just to pause and say, Lord, what you want to say to me, say to me. What you want to teach me, teach me. What you want to transform in me, transform. What you want to convict me of, just do whatever you want to do. And that open heart, uh, God shows up and does stuff. And so, um, so I, I think that just becoming a uh, somebody who accumulates Bible knowledge. Uh, there, there's professors. Uh, one of the, one of the, there's a top academic school in the Claremont Colleges in Southern California, where that you can get a degree in Old Testament or New Testament, and all your professors, all of them are atheists right. or antagonistic to faith. And you go, and, but they're they're teaching Old and New Testament. And you go, how's that work? Well. It, it becomes an academic pursuit, but it doesn't become a life transforming thing. And so I, it's not enough just to know the information in the Bible. It, we need to be humble enough to let it transform us and invite that. And, uh, and if somebody reads the Bible and, and doesn't, and, and, and is just trying to gather information, even if they're a Christian who's just saying, I wanna just get more information about God, we're still missing the point. It's, there, it's a relational component. And so we let the, let the word of God speak to our heart and let the spirit transform us as we read it. And 
and I want to kind of expand on that a little bit um, because I there's there is inviting God to change us during yeah. during our time of being in the Word. What mm-hmm. are some other ways that we can follow the teaching of the Bible, mm-hmm. and 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 why is this important to our mm-hmm. our spiritual lives? Yeah. Well, I think I think that one of the things with with the Bible is not just reading the Bible, but studying it. And so um, you can do. And one of the nice things about uh, we were having a little conversation before we started this about the the technical tools that are out there for us and how they can become overwhelming or overbearing. But there's also real strength to having access to some of the the technical tools we have. And so if somebody said, "I really want to learn to build strong friendships," you can you can go open up a, a browser and you can type in. Bible passages to help me build strong friendships. And it'll pop up 18 best passages, 100 passages about, about building friends. And, and, and you open up and there it is. And then you click on the link and you can read the passage. And so I think that, that we can look, you know, how do I have a healthy and strong marriage? What does the Bible have to say about it? Well, if I start in Genesis, I'm going to read through Revelation and try to find all the passages about a healthy marriage. That's going to be a lot of work. And if I can do that with every topic, you know, I'll le- learn the Bible pretty well over mm-hmm. time, but it's, it's going to be uh, laborsome, right? But I think that we need to start looking and saying, you know, how do I conduct myself in a business setting? Almost every question you, you could ask, almost every question you can ask, if you did a simple search, you're going to find some great passages. That if you read them, they can help shape your thinking. So if you say, well, what would the Bible say about business? All kinds of passages in the book of Proverbs about uh, honest weights and scales. I was talking with a business leader last night after our small group, and um, he said, I don't enjoy my business anymore. He says, there's so much dishonesty. I spend, I spend my time just dealing with dishonest people, knowing that they're, they're lying to me, knowing that he said, I've got sensors and trackers on some of the trucks we use and stuff. And they'll say this and that, and I'll pull them up and I'll go, no, that's not true. And he said, it's just, a, it's wow. just that. And it would be so easy for him to start to look and go, I don't I guess I got to play the game. I guess I got to do it like everyone else does it. But, uh, but if you're, as, if you're a follower of Jesus and you're saying, what does the Bible have to say about honesty and integrity in the workplace about being a hard worker, not, not cutting the corners, right? Um, you begin to read the scriptures and you see, boy, as you do your work, do it with all your heart. Um, do, do conduct your business with integrity. Um, do, and, and so, uh, almost any topic, if, if, if somebody listening to this says, well, I, I could probably think of a topic that's really practical to my life that's not in the Bible. Just try doing a simple search and do a search and say, what does the Bible say about dishonesty in business? And you, it's gonna, it's, you're going to have a list of, and you're going to read the passage, you're going to go, ouch, wow, that's clear, it's precise, it's challenging. And if you're tempted to cut corners, you're going to go, man, if I'm a Christian, I think I need to conduct myself differently. And so just to let the, to study the scriptures, I used to have a concordance and my concordance was about four times the size of my Bible. And it was about this wide and this tall. And people in the, in those days would say probably the Strong's exhaustive concordance. And it literally had, it listed every time that the word a or the, the was in the Bible and it listed every single passage. Right. So you go through and I would use that and I had to find four or five different themes that I could find. And now you can just type it in. And so there's tools out there that'll help you dig in and say, how does the Bible speak to this aspect of my life? And so, I have an abridged concordance. I think it yeah. has 1,500 pages. Yeah, just a little short one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you've kind of touched on it, but I, but I like this phrase or this idea, so I want to ask it, and maybe you can elaborate a little yeah. bit more. You talk about a move from snacking to feasting. Yeah. Um, again, I, th- I think you've touched on a little yeah, bit, but yeah. I'd, I'd love, yeah. I like the mental image of it. Yeah. Tell us what that means yeah. in the Bible to yeah. go from snacking to feasting. Yeah. A snack is something that doesn't ultimately usually satisfy your hunger and it doesn't uh, fill you up and strengthen you. Uh, it's just a little, it's a sample, it's a snack, it's a little bit. And I think some people look at the Bible that way. It's like, well, what's the least I can read and be done for the day? Uh, or I'll occasionally have a little Bible snack where I'll, I'll read a verse or two and move along. Uh, but there's, but feasting on God's word is just saying there's, there's so much here. I've, I mean, I've been through the Bible. I don't, I don't track how many times I've been through the Bible. I don't track how many times I've read a book of the Bible. Um, but I know that again and again and again, portions of the Bible I've read hundreds of times, they come alive in a fresh new way. The spirit of God speaks in a fresh way. And so I encourage people to just, if they, if they're kind of a Bible snacker to say, I want to begin to feast on scripture. I want to, one of the challenges I've given people through the years is I, I've said, um, spend the equal amount of time reading the Bible as you spend 
watching TV, watching shows, playing video games. I used to, I used to, I, I was big into video games when, when it was uh, like even pre Pac-Man, when it was Space Invaders, Asteroids. Pong? Pong, Pong was the earliest. Pong was a place we went to a Mexican place for dinner in the bar. They had that sit down like this table of Pong, turning the knob, one thing. Yeah. And you can make a wall and play against yourself. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, fun, fun stuff. So, you know, so for me, it's like those are things that, you know, part of, part of my life. But if I, I've said to people oftentimes, what if you read the Bible as much as you do some of these other things? As much as you just, you know, surf the internet or spend on YouTube or whatever it is that consumes your time. And most people, if they're honest, they'll say, well, I mean, I, I I can't spend that much time reading the Bible. Why? Because I'm spending so much time doing the other the other yeah. stuff. And so, if somebody's spending, you know, and we, there's studies done on how many hours per week people are are engaged in media, and it's it's flat out scary when you think about the younger generation coming up and how much they're immersed in this stuff. Mm -hmm. But if somebody says, well, you know, I get home from a hard day of work, I have dinner, talk with my family, but then I spend you know, you know three hours entertaining myself with these different things. What if you spend an hour and a half, an hour and a half reading the Bible? And most people, most people go like, well, that's, that's not even a thing. What you, that's not even right. like, I don't, no, why? why? Well, that's the feasting component. I'd mm -hmm. rather, I'm, I'm satisfied with a little snack. But, the, but, but if this is, and I believe it is, the Holy Spirit breathed truth of heaven, wouldn't we want to know more what it says? We would, wouldn't we want to have it challenge us and, and bless us and encourage us and let God use it in our lives? And so I say, Try, you know, try, try a week or two of feasting, and to do that, it means you're gonna have to cut something out. Mm -hmm. And most people, I don't have enough time. It's like, yes, you do. Almost everybody does. It's just what you do with your time. Yeah, I've noticed that in in lots of different areas. Uh, if you want to, you can cut out some other things uh, with yeah. the budget, right? You always yeah. have the. There's money you can carve out yep. there. Yeah. Well, you might not be ready to give up the mm -hmm. cable and the TV and that those things, but you could find more there. Yeah. I know with the time as well. I, I think for me, I have actually had a problem with snacking over the years mm. and that I, I try to find my, my fill of the Bible through devotionals. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not knocking devotionals. No. They can be good quality in there, mm -hmm. but I think you have that danger, right? You have a small verse that's in this yeah. supplementary yeah. book, yeah. and then the rest is just not the Bible. But it yeah. takes you a couple minutes, and you yeah. check it off the list yeah. and move on. Well, And you also get someone, someone else's take on that verse, right. so you're not sitting quietly and saying, Spirit of God, what do you want to say to me? Right. And you can find out what, what Max Lucado says, or you can find out what you're wearing, you know, <laughs> and, and they'll give you their perspective on it. But And it might be fresh and wonderful, but also God may want to say something very different to you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, there And there is something to be said from learning from other people. Yeah. And you often talk about learning from other people, and specifically you talk about four generations of, of learning yeah. or growing. How does that apply to the yeah. Bible engagement? Yeah. How do you yeah. see these four generations applying yeah. that way? Yeah. Well, each, each aspect of our spiritual growth, we should have people who are helping us to grow, tending to our own growth, helping others grow, and teaching them to do the same to kind of pass on the legacy of faith. So like with the scriptures, uh, a guy named John Byron, uh, John was a youth pastor at the Garden Grove Community Church. Uh, not when I became a Christian, the, the pastor, that youth pastor moved on, and then this guy came in, and he loved the Word. He taught me how to read the Word. He taught me the idea of journaling and writing down a few thoughts that struck me. I don't journal page after page after page, but I journal uh, just simple thoughts. This morning, I think I wrote down three or four thoughts out of Exodus 5 and 6, and then chose one of those and wrote a little bit, just a short little reflection, and then prayed that concept for a number of people in my life. And that was a practice I learned from John Byron. He took my hand, he helped, he gave me a vision of how I could study the Bible, not just read it, but really reflect on it in a different way. Then I tend to this in my own life each day, I open the word and I, I seek to learn from it. But then I can look and say, uh, whose hands can I take? When my, my boys were young, uh, we had a, we all, there was always some way I was trying to teach them to love the Bible. Uh, and I remember we had about a two year run where Sherry would wake the boys up about 10 to 15 minutes apart from each other. And then she'd send them down to the basement where we had a little fireplace there. And I would just I'd sit on the floor by the fireplace and each one would just come and sit down by me. And we'd read, I, you know, when they were real little, I'd read to them. A little bit later, they'd read to me. We'd go back and forth, talk about it a little bit, have a prayer and send them off and just try to model that for them. Um, I remember when my middle son, Josh, who's, who said, I like listening to the Bible. Well, there wasn't uh, phone apps that had it at that point. 
but I got him the Bible experience, which was this whole holder with <laughs> like all these uh, D, you know, uh, C, CDs, you know, and, 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 but he loved that. And that gave him a chance to listen to, and it was all, mo- most of the people who read the Bible were actors. Like I think Morgan Freeman was God and mm-hmm. there's all these different, you know, right. different actors that, that uh, read the, the passages in the Bible. And women read the women's part, so you hear a different voice. Uh, and so for me, you know, then so I'm then was helping my sons and lots of different pastors. I've had a chance to mentor and other people, and then teaching them in turn to teach the next generation. I hope and pray that my sons each will teach their children to love the word. Mm-hmm. Um, I can, you know, I can look at lots of different people, you know, pastors I'm pointing to who are now teaching the word to others and teaching them to pass it on. So again, even with the Bible, my growth is influenced by others. I tend to my own growth. I help people grow and I teach them how to help others grow and pass it along. Yeah. Well, throughout this series, through the book, through all of what we're talking about was uh, the marriage of evangelism and mm-hmm. discipleship. Yeah. When we're talking about the Bible and Bible engagement, um, what are ways that we can take the Bible or the Bible can, yeah. can bring hope and light yeah. Yeah. Uh, into this world that so desperately needs it? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, one of the, oftentimes the, the, what comes to my mind is not how to do something, but how not to do things. And okay, for, for fair some, enough. For some Christians, they're, 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 they want to force the Bible on people who don't believe the Bible is true. Well, it says so It says so in the Bible. And some people go, I, I grew up in an atheistic home. That right. doesn't fly very far if somebody doesn't believe that the Bible is inspired by God. Mm-hmm. And so I don't tend to start with the Bible says so. I don't tend to start with you have to believe it because I believe it. Um, but when somebody's going through a challenging time and they ask a question, what do you think about this or that? I'll often, I'll often say, you know, there's a really powerful thought, and I'll kind of share that thought. And if they say, well, where, where, where'd that come from? Well, it actually comes from the Bible. Uh, my my wife Sherry had a friend of hers who was going through a long journey with her, one of her parents, you know, going through cancer and then passing away. And this person at the time was not a believer, but Sherry began giving this person Bible passages to read, and they found incredible comfort and incredible encouragement. Um, I'll often share things that something I've been preaching on or thinking about with with a, a non-believing friend or family member, or I'll just talk about I, I, with my dad. I would often my dad didn't become a Christian until the last month of his life, but my dad I would often he just he'd, he'd say you know how's your work how's your work going, and uh, and 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 he and he I, it was partly being polite being a dad. I said oh dad I'm in the middle of this this series right now where I'm preaching about this and I just start to. I start to share with him what God was teaching me as I was preparing to teach other people. And it's all out of scripture. And so I was able to share scripture. So I think just finding ways, if, if nothing else, if you want your, your love for scripture to impact those who don't know Jesus, um, if they ask about your life and what's happening in your life, and some people aren't interested and never ask, but good friends will ask what's happening in your life. Um, one of the things that ought to be, ha- now you can't make it up and lie to them. That's a bad idea. But if you're, if the word of God is speaking to you, if it's teaching you, if it's shaping your life, you say, oh man, I have had this part of my life being transformed. Uh, and really it's come because I've been reading this book of the Bible or I've been reflecting on this truth of the Bible, this thing that Jesus said, and it's really changing my life. That's People are like, like the, the Bible is some old crusty book that doesn't have to do, do with anything. And we say, no, it's, it's like it says of itself, it's living and active. There's power here. When people hear that in your life, they, they can become curious and want to know for themselves. Oh, that's yeah. an interesting thing that you say that because I'm having now this picture of We'll use quotes from lots of things today, yeah. right? We'll quote William Shakespeare yeah, and it'll yeah. end up being a, a tweet that's retweeted, mm-hmm. you know, a thousand mm-hmm. times. Yeah. We'll we'll find a bumper sticker and put that out there. Yeah. Um, and I think sometimes though we're, I don't know, afraid or, yeah. or hesitant yeah. to use the Bible because yeah. we're afraid of what people will think. But, yeah. but we'll quote a random actor and throw yeah. that out there, yeah. you know, uh, or movie. Yeah, and, and sometimes, uh, sometimes we can quote movie lines more readily than the Bible. And so it's hard It's hard to share something powerful from the Bible if you haven't learned it yourself and if it hasn't impacted right. your life. Hmm. Yeah. That's an interesting thing. Mm-hmm. So there is a lot in the Bible that can yeah. can be brought out into this world. Yeah. Can you think, I don't know, in 2022, with the, kind of the, the state of the way things are, any kind of themes or um, mm-hmm. messages in the Bible yeah. that you could see really applying yeah. uh, today? Yeah. I don't think the Bible applies to our world today. No. Um, in, unless, unless what the world needs is peace. And then the Bible really applies because it has a lot to say. Or if what the world wants is joy, then the Bible has a lot to say. Or if the world, people in the world want direction for their life, then maybe the Bible, you know. So, the so point, a few times. The, 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 the things that most people are longing for 
actually are found in Jesus and are revealed in the scriptures. And and we're just often looking in the wrong places. Or or we read the Bible in in a way that it's well, I you know, we we play Bible roulette, you know, where you go, okay, today I'll read here. And then that tomorrow I read here. And there's no sense of direction or you know, but if we're reading thoughtfully in a directed way around themes that matter in our lives, God has a lot to say to us. And so I think that um now come to think of it, I have to change my answer. I do think the Bible has something to say to the world today. Uh, lots to say on, on probably almost every meaningful topic. Yeah. I believe our, our hope is that Christians, followers of Jesus, will engage with the Bible in an yeah. in increasing measure. Mm-hmm. No matter how long they've been walking with Jesus, how long they've been in the Bible, that they're yeah. continuing to grow in that. Yeah. If Christians grow in their engagement in the Bible, mm-hmm. how do you, if you do, see yeah. that impacting the way they interact with their community, with, yeah. the, with the world, yeah. and really on mission yeah. with Jesus. Yeah. I'd answer that with just one simple concept, and that is the more you read the Bible, you more, the more you understand the heart of God. Mm. And when you know the heart of God, who came to this world, who died for this world, who loves the broken and lost in this world, your heart becomes like the heart of God. The scriptures make us, make our heart become like the heart of God if we let it, if we let it. And that will bring us out with his love to the world. Mm. Yeah. I love that idea. I, I know you are, and I am very practical. and want to know, yeah. okay, what do I what do? I do? Mm-hmm. What steps can our listeners take yeah. now, today, yeah. uh, tomorrow, and this week to yep. come yeah. to begin to have a deeper engagement yeah. in the Bible? Yeah. Find your Bible or get a Bible. <laughs> And anybody listening, if you're if you're part of Shoreline Church or if you're in the Monterey area, uh, we'll give Bibles to anybody who a Bible to anybody who wants one, a, a nice Bible, uh, and uh, and then begin reading it. If somebody doesn't know where to start at Shoreline, if you're part of Shoreline, we encourage you just to follow. We have a daily reading plan that we create every week that prepares you for the next Sunday's message. But begin reading the Bible. You know, have a Bible, know where it is, read it regularly, talk about it, mm-hmm. talk with people about the Bible people who are believers, people who, who can encourage you along the way, uh, live out what it says. Always when you read the Bible, think in terms of, okay, so what? What do I do about it? And then um, when the moment's right, uh, share the things you're learning with the people you care about the most. And some of those people aren't going to be Christians, but they want, if they love you, they care about what matters to you. And if what matters to you is the truth of the Bible, share those stories. Yeah. And how about the person who says, I love Jesus, but I just, I just don't find myself you know, reading the Bible regularly, mm-hmm. what mm-hmm. what advice would you have for them? Yeah, I it it, it may be that they're not a reader. We're we're, we're in a um, almost a post literate culture right now, mm-hmm. where people are more they listen to stories, uh, watch stories more than listening, but watch stories. Um, a lot of people have been impacted by the um, this this recent. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't had a chance to watch it. What is it? What is it? The uh, the Jesus, uh, the, the chosen, the chosen. Yeah, chosen. Mm-hmm. Um, and people are really being impacted by that because it's something they can watch and they can. You know. So I would say if if somebody's struggling, they say, "I love Jesus. I want to know His truth, but I, I have a hard time reading." Maybe it's that they aren't a big reader, uh, but you can listen uh, to the scriptures. And if you have a phone and a basic Bible app, um, you can uh, listen. <coughs> you know, listen to what it says. Uh, my one of my sons is more of a listener than a reader, and so the one way back when he was younger, when he got in the Bible experience, he still listens to the Bible every day. This it's thing, one of the things he does first in, in his day, but and he uses the Shoreline app and he goes to it and hits the thing and plays it, and sometimes hits it a second time and okay, I'm good. But he's getting it in his heart and his mind. So listen to the Bible, um, talk about the Bible, and and, and I th- would say too, if somebody just says, I love to read. Uh, I love Jesus, but I really am not interested in the Bible. I would say, ask yourself why. Is there something there that um, is getting in the way of it? And it might be hidden sin in your life. It might be that you're angry at God about something that happened that that was difficult and you don't know why God allowed it to happen, but say, Lord, why is it that I'm not? It it might be that that you, when you read the Bible, it makes you uncomfortable because it points out things that you don't want to think about. But grapple with the why. And, and, and even and I would say even this, if, if you're raising a child who says, I don't like eating, as a parent, there's a point where you say, but kiddo, you're going to die if you don't eat. Mm. So let's get in a rhythm and then see if with time you grow to love it. Well, I asked you quite a few directed questions. I'm going to yeah. end with an open-ended one. Yeah. 
any last words for our listeners as it comes yeah. to to Bible engagement and yeah. uh, any message you'd want to get across to them? Yeah, one last thought that we really haven't touched on, I think, is, a, is an important one, and that is read the Bible, but also commit some passages to memory. That's not just for little kids. It's for anyone who loves Jesus and, and loves his word. So if you pick an area of your life where you need to grow or learn, if you're dealing with this temptation, or if you're dealing with anger, and you look up, you, know, you do a search on Bible passages about overcoming anger. And when you find find one or two that you really like, that are really helpful, and put them in your phone, put them as a screensaver, post it somewhere you're going to see it when you brush your teeth in the morning or whatever, and then just go over that till it's be part of your mind, part of your heart. And uh, there's just something really good about uh, having Bible passages locked in our minds and locked in our hearts and ready to come out on our lips. And so uh, if you've never done that before, or if you haven't done it since you were, you know, second or third or fourth grade in Sunday school, um, come at it from a more grown-up standpoint, but say, I want to commit some passages to memory and see if God can use that to impact my heart. Mm. Well, that's wonderful. If you don't mind, I'd like to close this podcast with a prayer. That'd be great. I would love to pray. I love that. Yeah. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time, and I thank you for your word. I thank you for how it is still today alive mm. and breathing and breathing life into uh, each of us who allow ourselves to be molded and shaped um, by it. Mm. And it is my prayer and our prayer that, that those who um, hear this podcast would engage more fully, more deeply um, with your word and that they would allow it to, to penetrate their lives and their, their hearts mm-hmm. and that ultimately they would be transformed. Yeah. I pray that for us as well, that we would grow in our love for your word. We would grow in our engagement and that through it, um, our lives would be changed, would be transformed, and we would truly become more like Jesus. And I pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, Yeah. This has been a a fun time. My joy. Thank you. All right. Whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on your podcast app, make sure to subscribe for more. See you next time.